This man sent over 400,000 people to the afterlife at Auschwitz during World War II. And the worst part, he never faced justice for it. His name is Josef Mengele, and we are diving deep into his twisted mind and how he got away. From 1943 to 1945, Mengele built up a reputation as the angel of death at the concentration camp Auschwitz in Poland. He performed some of the most insane and gruesome medical experiments on thousands of prisoners. Mengele's unwavering belief in the ridiculous Nazi racial theory justified countless cruel tests and treatments on Jewish and Romani people. Before we get to what some of these experiments were and how he got away after the war, let's try to understand where Mengele came from growing up and how he ended up in his position within a Nazi regime. Josef Mengele lacks a horrific past to which one can point while seeking to justify his heinous actions. Mengele was born on March 16, 1911 in Gunzburg, Germany, to a popular and wealthy family whose father managed a thriving business at a time when the national economy was in shambles. Everyone in school seemed to enjoy Mengele, and he received high marks. After graduating, it seemed obvious that he would move on to university and achieve everything he set his mind to. In 1935, Mengele received his first doctorate in anthropology from the University of Munich. He completed his postdoctoral study at the Frankfurt Institute for Hereditary Biology and Racial Hygiene under Nazi eugenicist Dr. Ottmar Freiherr von Verschur. National Socialism's philosophy has always believed that individuals were the result of their ancestors, and von Verschur was one of the Nazi-aligned scientists whose work attempted to validate that claim. Von Verschur's research focused on genetic influences on birth defects, including cleft palates. Mengele was a dedicated assistant to Von Verschur, and he graduated from the lab in 1938 with a glowing recommendation and a second degree in medicine. Mengele's dissertation topic was ethnic impacts on the formation of the lower jaw. However, Josef Mengele would soon be doing far more than simply writing about eugenics and Nazi racial philosophy. Josef Mengele joined the Nazi party in 1937, at the age of 26, while working under his mentor in Frankfurt. In 1938, he joined the SS and the Wehrmacht Reserve Unit. His unit was called up in 1940, and he appears to have volunteered for the Waffen-SS medical duty. Between the fall of France and the Soviet Union's invasion of Poland, Mengele performed eugenics by assessing Polish nationals for future Germanization, or race-based citizenship in the Third Reich. His regiment was sent to Ukraine as a fighting unit in 1941. Josef Mengele soon rose to prominence on the Eastern Front. He was decorated multiple times, including once for lifting wounded comrades out of a flaming tank and was frequently praised for his dedication to duty. However, a German army surrendered in Stalingrad in January of 1943. Another German army was annihilated at Kursk that summer. Between the two fights, Mengele was seriously wounded during the meat grinder onslaught at Rostov, rendering him unfit for further military activity. Mengele was sent to Germany, where he met his old master von Verschur and got a wound badge, a promotion to captain, and the mission that would make him famous. Mengele reported for labor at the Auschwitz detention camp in May of 1943. Mengele arrived at Auschwitz during a period of transition. The camp had long been a location of forced labor and POW detention, but during the winter of 1942-43, it ramped up its killing machine, centered on the Birkenau subcamp where Mengele was posted as a medical officer. With the uprisings and closures in the Treblinka and Sobibor camps, as well as the heightened tempo of the killing campaign across the east, Auschwitz was about to get very busy, and Mengele would be right in the middle of it. According to later accounts supplied by both survivors and guards, Josef Mengele was an energetic member of the staff who volunteered for extra jobs, oversaw operations technically above his pay grade, and seemed to be nearly everywhere at the camp at the same time. There's no doubt that Mengele was at home in Auschwitz. His outfit was usually pressed and immaculate, and he always appeared to be smiling. Every doctor in his section of the camp was compelled to serve as a selection officer, separating incoming batches of prisoners between those who would work and those who would be gassed right away, and many found the work dismal. Josef Mengele, on the other hand, liked his duty and was always prepared to take other doctor's shifts on the entrance ramp. In addition to deciding who would be gassed, Mengele oversaw an infirmary where the sick were executed, assisted other German doctors with their tasks, supervised inmate medical staff, and conducted his own research among the thousands of inmates he had personally selected for the human experiment program that he also started and managed. Josef Mengele's experiments were horrifying beyond belief. 
Motivated and energized by the seemingly limitless pool of condemned human beings at his disposal, Mengele continued the work he began in Frankfurt by researching the impact of genetics on numerous physical features. He utilized hundreds of captives as test subjects for his human experiments, many of whom were still children. He preferred identical twin children for genetic study because they had identical genes. Any differences between them must have resulted from external reasons. Mengele saw sets of twins as ideal test subjects for identifying genetic elements by comparing and contrasting their bodies and behavior. Mengele got hundreds of pairs of twins, sometimes spending hours measuring and noting various areas of their bodies. He frequently injected one twin with unknown drugs and observed the resulting illness. Mengele also used harsh clamps to inflict gangrene on children's limbs, injecting dye into their eyes, which were subsequently shipped back to a pathology lab in Germany, and gave them spinal taps. Whenever a test subject died, the child's twin was instantly slain with a chloroform injection to the heart, and both were dissected for comparison. Joseph Mengele once killed 14 pairs of twins in this way, and spent a sleepless night performing autopsies on his victims. Mengele, despite his rigorous work habits, could be impetuous. During one of the arrival platform selections, between work and death, a middle-aged mother who had been assigned employment refused to be separated from her 14-year-old daughter, who was selected for death. A guard who attempted to tear them apart received a serious scratch on the face and had to retreat. Mengele intervened to handle the situation by shooting both the girl and her mother on the spot. He then cut short the selection procedure and dispatched everyone to the gas chamber after murdering them. Another time, the Birkenau doctors disagreed over whether a youngster they had all grown fond of had tuberculosis. Mengele left the room and returned an hour or so later, apologizing for the dispute and acknowledging his error. During his absence, he shot the youngster and then dissected him to look for symptoms of the sickness, which he did not find. Mengele's passion and enthusiasm for his grueling labor gained him a post as camp manager in 1944. In this role, he was in charge of public health measures in the camp, as well as his own personal studies at Birkenau. His impulsive nature manifested once more when he made judgments for tens of thousands of vulnerable convicts. When typhus broke out in one of the women's barracks, Mengele handled it in his trademark fashion. He had one block of 600 women gassed and their barracks fumigated. Then he transferred the next block of women over and fumigated their barracks. This process was repeated for each women's block until the final one was clean and ready for a new round of workers. He repeated this stunt a few months later during a scarlet fever outbreak. Throughout it all, Joseph Mengele's experiments persisted, getting increasingly cruel as time passed. Mengele sewed together sets of twins in the back gouged out the eyes of individuals with different colored irises and vivisected toddlers who formerly knew him as the sweet old Uncle Poppy. When Noma Gangreen emerged in a Romani camp, Mengele's ridiculous obsession with race led him to examine the hereditary reasons he suspected was to blame. He sawed off the heads of diagnosed inmates to investigate this and sent the preserved samples to Germany for analysis. After the majority of Hungarian prisoners were slain during the summer of 1944, transportation of new captives to Outwich slowed down during the autumn and winter of 1944, and eventually ceased entirely. But how did the Angel of Death, responsible for hundreds of thousands of murders, escape his fate and live to die of natural causes many years later? By January of 1945, the Auschwitz camp complex had been mostly demolished and the starved prisoners were forcibly marched to, of all places, Dresden, which was due to be bombed by the Allies. Josef Mengele collected his research notes and specimens, left them with a trusted friend and traveled west to evade Soviet capture. Josef Mengele eluded the triumphant Allies until June, when he was apprehended by an American patrol. He was traveling under his own identity at the time, but because the wanted criminal list had not been distributed efficiently, the Americans let him go. Mengele worked as a farmhand in Bavaria until deciding to flee Germany in 1949. Mengele evaded capture for decades by using a variety of aliases, including his own identity. It helped that nearly no one was hunting for him and that the governments of Brazil, Argentina and Paraguay were all friendly to the escaping Nazis who sought asylum in their countries. Even in exile and with the world at stake if he was caught, Mengele couldn't stay quiet. In the 1950s, he established an unauthorized medical practice in Buenos Aires specializing in clandestine abortions. 
When one of his patients died, he was arrested, but according to one witness, a buddy of his came up in court with a bulging envelope full of cash for the judge, who later dismissed the case. Israeli efforts to apprehend him were thwarted, first by the opportunity to apprehend SS Lt. Col. Adolf Eichmann, and then by the imminent possibility of war with Egypt, which diverted the Mossad's attention away from fugitive Nazis. Finally, on February 7th of 1979, Josef Mengele, 67, went for a swim in the Atlantic Ocean near Sao Paulo, Brazil. He died after suffering a sudden stroke in the water. After Mengele's death, his friends and family members eventually revealed that they had known where he had been hiding all along and had protected him from prosecution. A Brazilian court granted the University of Sao Paulo jurisdiction over Mengele's exhumed bones in March of 2016. It was then agreed that his remains would be used for medical study by student doctors. Joseph Mengele was one of the worst humans to ever walk around on this earth, and we failed the victims of his horrific crimes by letting him live in freedom for that long. Let us never forget the heinous acts committed during the Second World War. If you want to learn more about some of the crazy things the Nazis did during the Second World War, click here. And please don't forget to like and subscribe to Untold History.